Good evening, friends. It's uh, really remarkable to be here, having been here before. But to be in this pavilion, which I have only seen and experienced in the last 15 minutes, is a total pleasure. Out of debris comes something quite remarkable, both in terms of its orientation as well as in terms of its spatial coordinates. It's a, where, where is the architect? <laughs> Hi. Congratulations, it's a, it's a splendid, and that counter facade that you have there on the angle is, uh, is remarkable. It's both aspirational, but it's also about how difficult it is to get anywhere when the ground beneath your feet is continually breaking and slipping. So I think it's very much a matter for the, for the, for the times uh, we're in. To say nothing of the times that the uh, Kochi Biennale has just come through. So, Bose and the whole committee, I think we need to thank you. Where is Bose? We need to thank you all and uh, congratulate you for keeping up this remarkable art event that uh, lifts our spirits at a time when there is not much that does that. So, thank you very much and thanks to the committee. I also want to thank the KNMA, Rubina Karod and Kiran Nader for their uh, generosity and uh, their warm invitation to be here. And of course, um, 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 without uh, Jitish, this would not have happened. And so Jitish and I have been in conversation for several years about many things. Our studio visits with him are an absolute delight because we both hold forth, we tape what we say, that was his idea, we just tape these conversations, and then there is a break for this amazing Kana, Gurkha Kana, that comes from his home. Uh, something that uh, he always shares with me. Thank you, Jitesh, for, uh, for, for him. So I just arrived uh, from Bombay, uh, literally a couple of hours ago, so I can't say anything beyond what I have seen so far, and for what I have talked about, and uh, much of that concerns my thoughts on the attentiveness and thoughtfulness of Jitish's work, uh, which I admire for its care, for its lack of flash, and for its ability to emerge from an ongoing and deep commitment of his own with the question, as I see it, of time. You know, time is the most elusive of uh, representational objects. Um, sometimes we can represent it by calling it history. Sometimes we talk about it at the fa as the facts of the times that we're living in. Sometimes time in cinema, of course, is the central way in which meaning and movement are created. But for Jitish, time is a profound problem of scale. From some of his earliest works to the more recent ones, the inscription of time by flame, by, by color, by um, um, the, the fading of a pencil sketch, uh, time becomes crucial. And it's very difficult to hold on to time um, in a way that can actually communicate the problems of temporality. Now, I think, Jitesh, that we're now in a time where globally, with the pandemic, we have experienced both the heaviness of time, for some of us, and for others of us, 
the rapid onslaught of time in death and disease. I think this is the very moment of the pandemic uh, has created a time capsule or a time framework um, which has um, made um, tactile, physical, even aesthetic to us, and certainly ethical, the problem of time and mortality, time and morbidity. So I think that this issue of the pandemic is something that we should return to, not specifically in any feature of a work, but a general enveloping um, um, happening of the pandemic. And of course, that, that notion of time, where we survive at the cost of medical attention, where, where, if we can get it, but time and death, time and some kind of anticipation of death, um, had a very specific hold during the pandemic. And then, at least in the United States, there was that another scale of time, and I'm trying to, you know, talking about scales of time, 8.47 or nine minutes, death of George Floyd, black people and black men in particular had been shot on the streets before, there were a long history of this, but that 8.47 minutes encoded and represented in that video camera, I think these, the new technologies are very important for talking about time, allowed us to hold in our hand the very images of the death of another. But that proximity, that miniature representation of that death brought our own problems of time and death and existence and risk and danger, not only the risk to life, but the risks to living, it made that very uh, important. So there's the long pandemic time, the long durée and its death, the short moments and their deaths. In this country, if I may say so, please correct me if I'm wrong, the four hours on the 24th of April, was it, when of April and March, when people were asked to um, 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 de-densify cities in four hours between eight and 12, and people had to leave, you know, and these were, many of them were peace workers, many of them were migrants without any possibility of, uh, of, of transport and so on. So we have experienced a number of these times. Demonetization was an another one another one in India. So my, my opening question to you is that your interests in historical time, the work on Gandhi, uh, the way in which it is represented with the kind of, uh, how do you call it, the, f the film, the film of mist, that you walk through it as that moment showers you with its own density, which is, of course, gone now, but the mist is a kind of historical time and historical density. So my question to you really is, how do these features of our time and your work sit with another um, notion of time with which you are always fascinated, which is deep time, whether it's evolutionary time, whether it's biological time, whether it's anthropocentric time or indeed metaphysical time. So I'm just very briefly trying to round up a number of signifiers of time in your work and in our work and in our lives to ask you your view of time as scale. Uh, thank you, Homi, um, for our continuous conversations and dialogues. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, a brief moment to say thank you to Kirana, the museum, Kochi Muziris Biennale, and John Hansard Gallery, which is the primary site where these exhibitions took place. Um, in a way, Homi, the, 
idea of time has preoccupied almost in everything I do. Um, and this, I mean, at one fundamental level, uh, you said that you know time is one of those things that don't manifest itself to you. There's always a mystery of how time exists and where does it exist and how do we experience time. I mean, one could, as a shorthand, say that any time you see um, any change in your environment, you might uh, construe that to be a passage of time. I think one of the elements in the work has essentially been uh, this idea of the transition of time in, um, in scales, to put it differently, um, if I look at Shwetal in this front row or if I look at a friend in the back row, um, I'm looking at both of them now. But uh, Shwetal is as much in my past as he is distant from me. Um, if I stepped out and looked at the moon, the moon would be a second in my past. If I looked at the stars, then I see the stars as they were, when they were. Some of them don't exist anymore. And each of these scales of distances uh, produce not just at one level an experience of different scales of time, but also can produce for yourself a different awareness of your current present. And that's, uh, in fact, perhaps not so specific to the two exhibitions in question here, where essentially time as having a calendrical anchorage in a date marked by a historical moment, a historical recital, is really, I think, the direction of both these projects. But a lot of my other work tend to slip into wormholes where essentially what is this idea of time becomes quite central. And sometimes it's studio rituals, as Homi was pointing out, you know, setting a flame align or making note of changing births and deaths on the planet might all be ways to capture something that's otherwise not visibly tangible to you. Um, but I think in the, in the two works and the two, the two projects here, Covering Letter and uh, Tangled Hierarchy, uh, time essentially begins from the location of a date. Um, and in each of these, Homi, should we look at some of the images? Absolutely. Yeah, oh, okay. So, uh, in fact, the projects that you see here in Kochi, uh, Covering Letter and Tangled Hierarchy, the curatorial project, have their roots in a trilogy of works called Public Notice, Public Notice 2 and Public Notice 3. Essentially, the trilogy evolved in the course of a decade. And each of them have uh, an utterance uh, at the heart of the work. So Public Notice 3, it's Public Notice from 2003, which is now almost 20 years ago, essentially was a speech delivered by Jawaharlal Nehru at the midnight of Indian independence. Um, and the, the work itself um, appears through the motive of fire. Uh, progressively, alphabets, one after the other set of flame, produce a warped mirror in which uh, the present is continually kind of distorted. Or public notice two, for instance, where uh, a speech delivered by Mahatma Gandhi before he commenced the famous Dandi march, um, breaking the SALT Act, but announcing that he may be arrested or assassinated and that, of course, could lead to violence and thus puts out a kind of manual of instructions asking for complete non-cooperation with complete non-violence, total civil disobedience with total peace, very much in, in contradiction with much of the inflammatory uh, remarks or announcements we hear today, which are obviously oxymoronic statements. War on terror is nothing but progressive terror inflicted on terror. Um, or public notice three, and Homi is actually, I mean, I sh Homi should be the person speaking about this because he delivered this absolutely reverber reverberating lecture on the public notice trilogy at the Art Inch of Chicago when the exhibition closed. Uh, this is uh, a speech delivered by Swami Vivekanand um, on September 11th, but 1893, exactly 108 years, of course, before the attacks, but also at a moment that happened to be the first parliament of religions. 
a speech calling for an end of fanaticism, fundamentalism, bigotry. These were actually words in the speech, but also delivered exactly where the museum stands today. In 1893, the same edifice was the location of uh, the auditorium where the parliament took place. So essentially where Homi delivered that speech was a very lectern from where Vivekanand spoke. Um, so it's almost like a overlap of sight and date in that sense. Yeah. So, so you know uh, what's so interesting in what you've been saying is that time is elusive. Um, time passes. Historical events also lose their immediate historicity and, re and re emerge again in memory or as a kind of afterlife of the history of the nation or whatever. But you do something quite interesting, which is while exploring these intangible issues about time and meaning, you actually do use calendrical time. You love coincidences. You love the intersections. On this day, Vivekananda spoke here in this space, and 150 years or whatever it is later, 108 years, somebody else speaks here too. So there's this wonderful strategy of using uh, the, 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 the flow of time, which you can never catch up with. The point about time is interesting. You can never catch up with it from the past, because you can't catch up with the past. And you can never catch up with it in the future, because you're not there. So you're always in a moment of transition. You're always in a moment of court in between time. And I think that's a fascinating bit of your work. That's your, uh, a very interesting struggle of your work. To, to, make, to make visible, to make engageable, to make identified something that is so, so, so problematic and, and yet so absolutely essential. So in that context then, let's talk about these moments of transition. You're not talking about the end time and your work, is, as I understand it, is not about original time. When you talk about Gandhi, when you talk about Nehru, when you talk about Vivekananda here, the point is not simply to draw time's arrow into the back or time's arrow into the future. It is to somehow restage the, the elusiveness of that past moment in, in, in the present moment. So one of the things I think about, particularly when I think about Nehru's, um, Nehru's speech at, on the independence, you know, the midnight, the midnight hour uh, speech, is that the speech is so much about transition. At this point, we, we have this moment of our freedom, but we will never know what this moment is until and unless we look back at it from the future until the present uh, uh, conflicts with the future, con uh, 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 faces that future, which we will never know. So there is a sort of tangled hierarchy of time that you worked with in these earlier uh, moments and which still inform your thinking, I believe. And in this show, Tangled Hierarchy, you take the moment of partition. There's clearly a light motif of that, of that moment. You take the moment of partition, you take the moment of violence, you take the moment of finding a boundary or creating a boundary. And one of the most important things that I see there is something that uh, the philosopher Hannah Arendt said, that one of the important things you'll find in every experiment with creating a new nation of citizens is that there is always an outflow of migrants who have no place. And therefore, they can be accommodated in refugee camps. They can be given second class citizenship. She said, this is one of the most phenomenally interesting uh, 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 thoughts about the creation of nations, that out of many, one, but once that one nation gets solidified, it is open to an autocratic formation. It can be open to a majoritarian formation. 
ethno-nationalist formation, the many who were united are now minoritized. They're not the same people necessarily, they can be other people. So the founding of the nation is itself, as you, as I read your work, a very transitional moment. And yet, it is fundamental to all of these projects of yours, and it's also fundamental to many things I see in Tango Dara. The transitional time mm. of the things we think are most spatially solid, containing, holding us together. Our boundaries are, are being breached by our very act of trying to be bounded. Yeah, I think the idea of transition and the idea of imminence, I think both which recur in a lot of your work and thinking, Homi, I think are quite central to each of these instances because in each of these moments, they were already, in fact, I almost feel that the utterance is a manifestation of the density of the moment rather than essentially words of an individual. So in a way, they become uh, conditions producing words rather than people producing sounds, you know? Um, and uh, while the overlap of dates between partition to future moments of rioting and violence through which one can telescope back through this text back and forth or the exact overlap of words that began to proliferate a post 9-11 world, but being uttered at the first parliament of religions on the very date when this ideological breakdown occurs, um, or in the sort of instance of say, um, covering letter, um, a letter that is dispatched five weeks before the onset of the second world war uh, before Hitler's own, uh, you know, progressive increasing brutality was to hit another, uh, another peak in terms of its savagery, the letter is dispatched, of course never received, um, but uh, written by uh, Gandhi to Hitler uh, five weeks before with very peculiar parentheses. It begins with the words, dear friend, Friends have been urging me to write to you for the sake of humanity, and makes a seven-line plea asking Hitler to rethink his ways, but he also signs off with the word, your sincere friend. And as Homi and I have spoken in the past, uh, there's a follow-up letter in which, of course, Gandhi elaborates, saying that in my world of universal friendship, I know no foe. But this letter, in a way, contains a dense ambiguity also in terms of how does one speak to another uh, who in constitution and action and uh, representation and in every way um, opposes any moral ethical fiber that you may hold and what might be the terms of that conversation. So once again, in each of these instances, it's not just a binary of date sometimes, but also a, a circumstantial binary because Public notice, the first one was made at the time of the Gujarat riots, but you could actually reread partition at the time, or public notice three with the overlap of 9-11, or in Gandhi and Hitler, a certain kind of binary in terms of what each of these individuals, the recipient and sender, hold even as if you had to ascribe direct symbolic representation of how they figure to us through their pronouncements and their life actions. Well, one of the fascinating things is you speak as an artist and as a critic is the question of the scale of representation. You know, we could talk about content, we could talk about ideas, but I've been trying to push you to talk about things like time and scale. I think one of the most effective things that came out of what you just said, that here is a letter, you know, something of this size, handwritten, uh, being sent to a Hitler who is the uh, addressee, and there the question is not so much about the efficacy of language. It's not as if, you know, Hitler at that point is going to sit and say, you know, Mr. Gandhi has written this very sweet, well-considered, loving letter. I think I should really rethink my entire strategy. You know, it, 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 Mr. Hitler is not thinking that. Mr. Hitler is thinking, 
how can I produce more gas, mm. rather like you have in uh, your work here? You know, that gas to me is a, is a sign of re rethinking the letter and death at the same time, because Jews were actually killed with gas. It's very much like that. And when we walk through the ga that gas, and when we read the fragility of language on that, uh, for one of, on that mist, mm. I think it's a consolation. It's a very complex, to use your word, tangle, uh, a difficult moment, because it is the moment of the fragility of a letter, the fragility of words, and the massive uh, uh, barbaric violence mm. coming together. So I think one of the things that makes this work conceptually interesting is actually size, the size of a historical crime, uh, the uh, uh, historical crime against humanity, uh, 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 the size of a plea written in a letter form. And I think, it's, I think those, are not, those are not polarities, but those are juxtapositions. Th those works are works of montage, in a way. And that's where I feel that scale and time work so well. But having said that, so I wanted to be a bit of a formalist here, you know, and a bit of a conceptual. So having said that, I wonder why you juxtap what, what I wonder what is lies morally, ethically, politically behind your choice of these objects. And we'll come to talk about the um, tangled hierarchies later. Uh, are you basically a pacifist at heart? Mm. <laughs> yes. Do you feel I that? Think it's a bit, but yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> no, actually, I do need to think about it. I'm, I'm a pacifist. I think. You, you, you're a pacifist at heart. No, you, I can tell that from you. The difference between the way you talk and I talk <laughs> so immediately makes that obvious. Then, having, do you then think that pacifism, um, even of the of the very um, highly uh, nuanced and metaphysically powerful pacifism of somebody like Gandhi, do you feel that that pacifism? creates a kind of social quietism. Do you think that there is something deeply ironic and problematic in both those Gandhi letters? Yes, please. You know, I think uh, the, the letter is a very complicated letter because at, it's complicated because it's in most terms seemingly simplistic. Um, you know, it, it does appear that A, the recipient's going to not pay much heed. Uh, two, what are seven lines going to do? Um, so I'm not really essentially justifying Gandhi's pacifism. But I'm actually interested in a form of interlocution where empathy, I mean, it's actually, I think, the sort of the code of any debate, right? I mean, the, the best way to make sense of an argument is to understand and explain to your adversary what they're trying to tell you. So I think the idea of Gandhian notion of not necessarily defeating your enemy, but converting them or transforming them, I think uh, aligns closely to a perception that seems valuable in today's world. Um, yet this... Talking in terms of scale, Homi, of course, I was acutely aware in each of these instances of the scale of the human body. Um, in, in public notice, the first one, it, the mirror is the scale of the human who will face it. Uh, public notice two, you just have to walk and walk. Um, and I was told by an, an audience member in Sydney that it takes 26 minutes to see the work. So, you know, I, I, somebody timed the work. So there's also temporality there. But here again, the body actually moving through what is otherwise the promise of cleansing, which I think led to gas in a historical moment, but the water. And I think Homi was one of the first people to actually read the notion of gas into the work. To me, most of these works come unassigned with direct symbolic uh, experience when I first conceived them. 
I mean, for me, the presence of the body in the work, in the letter, in a permanently atomizing letter, was really the image. Meanings follow and accrue and aggregate over time. Yeah, I mean, to me, you know, when I first saw this at the Mani Bhavan, this, this letter, I saw it soon after I made, I think, Public Notice 2, you know, 2007. Um, I mean, all I could think of was actually the human presence in the letter. And I didn't know how to do this. There wasn't available technology um, to do it. But all I knew was I just wanted to walk through it or be present in that space. Eventually, you know, these works stay five, six years before they find a form, or formlessness in this instance. Um, there's nothing of a letter in that space except light and shadow, uh, because essentially all you're having is a permanently atomizing, seemingly a parchment, but it's just, it's just water molecules that are catching light. And as the light falls through, it forms this cascade, like a carpet you could walk in. You step in, your feet are lit, your knee is lit, you're half lit, and as you move through, you're fully lit, and then you walk back into darkness again. So in a way, it's a condition of luminosity and darkness, which is in, in fact the space of the letter. Um, and then, of course, uh, I mean, there's always this, and I think that's a very complex thing to say, so I probably shouldn't say it. Not when Homi is seated here. He's going to pull me up. But I think you know, there's this triangulation that was quite central to my asking the question about what is that individual space in the sender recipient if we think of a binary in, in the epistolary? There is a sender, there's a recipient. And if you've cut through that letter, what is that body doing? You know, something of that kind. I don't know, it doesn't make much sense, but that's the internal ramble through which the work sort of emerged. But I think that this is a very, I don't know how much time we have. I mean, we could go on, but I think this is a very, um, important idea as to link us back to tangled hierarchies, where the body in many different forms and in many different media uh, is placed on the boundary, on the political boundary. And when the body falls on the political boundary, and I think a little bit about Tayyab Mehta here too, when the body falls on the diagonal, whether it's the, it's the, the, the boundary between India and Pakistan, or whether it's, as you do it between in the football uh, 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 videos, which I think are very effective, or on the question of the, you know, the, 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 the loss of the limb, the, the whole body pivots in trying to, to make the phantom limb either disappear or, phantom limb either disappear or, or, or keep, or, or keep occurring. So I think that this idea of who is the addressee and who is being addressed is really important. Because there is no letter without an addressee, even if it doesn't reach, you know. And in Hitler's situation, it certainly, the letter didn't, in a profound sense, reach him. But if your, I think your interest, from what I can gather, is in the human subject of Gandhi being written, as you say, being more present in the writing, in the authority of the words, than in the authorship, you know, as the, as, as the physical writer. But who do you think he was writing to? So it's interesting, you know, I, had, I hadn't known the second letter for at least a few months after I read the first one. And, but my intuition with that first letter was there was a fundamental Gandhian move in, in actually also writing it in a way that if the British were to intercept the letter, they would have to read it. And it actually asks the same questions that they could, he could ask of the British. So in an interesting way, the second letter that he wrote, which is actually a justification for his first letter, where he actually felt probably morally burdened to having called Hitler a friend, because in the five weeks thereafter, Hitler couldn't be called a friend. Perhaps even Gandhi lost, you know, the, you know, the... This is the date of the letter? Uh, so this is, I think, uh, 39. Uh, 39, yes, yeah. Ju July yeah. 39. First September yes. 39, yes, yes, that's right. Into, uh, into Poland. Yes, so and end July. And so this, the second letter, which is after all the savagery, 
uh, he ends by saying that this could be to other dictators. You could simply change name and context. And that actually felt to me like the, in, the feeling I had that this is not just a direct letter, but it's, in fact, it's an open letter. In fact, it's also a letter that we could receive. If all of us got that in the mailbox, and if all of us could save the world from going to a savage state in small, minor ways, that might be an interesting thought, right? If it's just proliferated, if there was Twitter, and Gandhi could tweet it, you know? <laughs> my, my feeling here uh, and, and is this, that I think Gandhi was writing this letter to himself. Sorry, I think he was writing this letter to himself. I think he was writing this letter to those who followed him, to those who believed him. Um, I think wh where that letter, as opposed to your work, for me, um, uh, sounds good-hearted, but slightly soft-headed, is that he isn't getting into the head of what a fascist dictator's desires are, or what a fascistic, you know, the, what the, what the, di, di, what the fantasy of the, a, a fascistic desire, what the notion of extermination is, um, you know, it's. Uh, I, I, so I think the letter is a self-reflective letter. It's a mirror image, but it doesn't take on the anxiety. Gandhi of moving outside of the Gandhian mm. uh, framework to be able to now think from the place of a pacifist, what might be the desire, what might be the passion of those who are so politically perverse. That's why I think the interlocution is weak, in my view. That's why I think by putting the mist there, which I think I mentioned to you, it's not only about the letter carrying its message on the mist, but when I first walked through it, I felt, my God, this is not just mist. This is the gas that killed six million Jews. You know, there was no way that I could avo avoid that feeling. Let's turn to Zarina, mm. whose work I greatly admire and have written about. Um, let's let's think about that one uh, you know she's done many of them those very yeah those just the image of the border you know one of the things I've found remarkable in Zarina's work and it bears some resemblance to your fireworks where you lit a fire and saw how it burned the page completely different technique completely different intention and purpose but here, too, in drawing the boundary that separated these two nations without giving us any mimetic indication, somebody who didn't know this history would not know what it was. Here, in this line, it holds the tension of time and space because the space around it has got an infinite time to it. It's not simply India and Pakistan. And this, I think, is a different way of making history, the time of history, um, n have a more universal resonance. So that's the kind of thread, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that you have pulled right through tangled hierarchy. I'm not saying this is the only work from which it comes, but all these notions of refugee camps and their borders, uh, um, uh, the, the, the games in the, uh, the uh, truth, yeah, the, the yeah, Kurukshetra, people putting their hands up when we know that they are in a refugee camp, that they are cheering or enjoying a moment of unanxious play because the other hand is tied behind their backs in a metaphorical and other way there. One hand is outside the, outside the bars of the prison, the other is in the refugee camp. And then your, uh, the, the phantom limb ideas. And while these linear forms, there's this, you know, the, as you pointed out, the hand going up, the boundary of the refugee camp, the, the, the hand that is not there but is there. While all, while all this is going on, I think of 
what, you, what, what I saw as the sort of a nucleus or kernel, which is the stack, Penrose's staircase, you know, his, his uh, what did he call them? He called them tiles. Penrose's tiles, which sort of go up and then come back again and go up and then come back again, those, that endless staircase. And I wonder whether the view here from your own position is that these things happen. We look down into the voids of Hades. We burn. We die. But this cycle continues. And we have to somehow take comfort in it, and therefore you are a pacifist who is not passive. Um, yes, Homi. Um, you know, just to, to circling back, because there's so much that you said which is really beautiful, but going to maybe the Gandhi um, gesture in, in covering letter, and the gesture within the envelopes. So we come to Tangle Hierarchy. Uh, so for those of you who haven't seen the exhibition, um, I'll step a few steps back. So these are the five um, envelopes that are at the heart of the work, heart of the exhibition. Uh, five envelopes that Gandhi may have received from different senders. Uh, the address on one side simply says Gandhi, New Delhi, Mahatma Gandhi, Bhangi Colony, speaks something about the stature of the man in his time, but also what happens is the day that Mountbatten comes to visit Gandhi happens to be 2nd of June, 1947, a day before the partition of India and Pakistan were announced. So obviously the visit was probably to seek his approval or uh, consultation. But Gandhi's words, as we all know, was widely known in the public domain, and his reservations about partition were well pronounced. Uh, similar to covering letter, there are so many things that happen in a few lines in the envelope that he hands back to Mountbatten. The day he visits him happened to be a Monday, the Monday that Gandhi was week keeping his weekly day of silence. So he writes on the back of the envelope saying that, this being my weekly Monday of silence, I shall not speak with you today. That said, when I took the vow of weekly silence, I reserved for myself the right to speak to high functionaries on matters of national importance or while attending to the sick, but I know that you don't want me to speak today. So, and then he continues with some trivial uh, other matters, which seem like just by the way on the side. But he puts the responsibility of his silence onto Mountbatten. Equally, one could say that various hierarchies em emerge and they get entangled because um, if he refuses to speak to Mountbatten on a Monday, is it because he's not a high functionary? Um, is it because he wasn't sick that day? Or is it because Mountbatten doesn't want him to speak? So just in that one sentence, uh, he refuses to speak on three counts. If it's high functionary, sick, or, but you want me to keep silence. In that sentence, there are multiple moves. And in fact, complicating relationships, hierarchy, interestingly, Mountbatten kept those envelopes, and they weren't just casual envelopes because Gandhi handed them, I can imagine, very performatively, because they're also numbered one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> so it's almost handed like a book. As it happened when we tried to negotiate this homie to bring it into the exhibition space, because this has never been really seen publicly, uh, you know, it had to be armed support that came and people slept. There was a person sleeping next to the letters at night uh, for added security. It became the most valuable object in Mountbatten's life archive. And in a sort of stroke, that, that object supersedes any other object that this powerful man was about to announce partition held in his lifetime. So all of these then led to questions that then began to sort of cascade into questions about what is the drawing of the border? What is the drawing of the Zarina's line, the, the Radcliffe line? What does that mean? What does that amputation of land mean? Is the amputation on, on body a carrier of messages that happen when land is amputated? People lose limbs, the pain recurs and continues in limbs that they don't have anymore. 
the phantom limb? Uh, do we have phantom pain on other side of the border? I mean, I know through my wife's family history that phantom pain survives. You know, Rina's family history, it's, it still comes up when you speak to elders. So, um, so in a way, these questions then led me from these envelopes into other entanglements. So the exhibition then becomes these layered conceptual loops that go back and forth between several of these ideas, between historical object, scientific artifact, such as the Penrose staircase, which also tells you you could go up now, uh, upstairs. When you go up, your sort of Roger Penrose hands you to sort of Roger Shepard, a cognitive scientist, and the body moving up the steps triggers a sound, which most people miss, actually, because they don't realize that their body has triggered a sound that begins to play. And if you hear the sound, it begins to ascend in your head. It's just a few notes that you're cognitively perceiving as anxiety-producing ascending tone. But the Penrose take is also tells you that you will come back here. But then you will return to Mikola Ridney, the Ukrainian artist, whose work essentially was a filming of a seacoast six years before the previous invasion of Ukraine, but 2014, 22, it can play on. So, so um, I think that's very useful. For those who've seen the show, it gives you a thread through it, but for those who haven't, I think it'll be a nice introduction to the show. But I want to come back to what you've just said. Um, what is the difference? You've, you, of the representation of the body, in this case, say, Gandhi's body, because you've talked so much about it. How does the body represent itself differently in silence and in writing? So he says, I keep silence today, but I can write. And I think that's actually um, uh, fascinating um, for your project as I see it, I, I'm, I'm silent, but I can write. Uh, what, would, what would the interlocution you talk of or the address uh, have been had he spoken and not written? What would his commitment have been or what would his interaction, identification with Mountbatten have been? And how does this make it different? Because Gandhi uses silence God bless his soul, very strategically also. As we know, there are certain meetings to which he wouldn't turn up, um, saying that what for whatever reasons he was done well or he wanted to, he, he felt he had to pray or whatever it was and m get Jinnah and Nehru together so they could duke it out or not duke it out. But he felt with his intervention, there was always, you know, people were kind of uh, moderating and working through him, and he wanted them to confront. So he's a very canny user of words, language, writing. From your point of view, what is the silence about in relation to the body, and what is the written about in relation to the body? I think, I think it's at some level to do with speed. Uh, speaking is faster than writing. And the restraint to speak, a personal constraint that you may put on yourself, can rub against the speed of thought. And I think that, I think, is a, is a useful place. Um, in this particular instance, the silence, again, has a sort of, one might say, like a upward, downward causation, uh, confusion or conflation, because um, you know, it's a kind of causal loop because, you know, I mean, let's say to talk differently, maybe you know, if you put a heater in the room, um, you distinctly know that the heater is heating up the room. It's not that the room is heating up the heater, you know. So that's a clear line of causation, you know, you can see. But where it gets entangled, that becomes kind of resourceful because, you know, you get caught in that strange loop. The, the, I think the potency of these notes is in that strange loop. Uh, that A, first of all, in that first line of communication, he dismantles the recipients. If there was aggression or if there was power, uh, that's uh, interestingly uh, worked with 
there is, of course, the imminence of a historical unfolding that maybe he cannot control. It's a human being writing the note. But in, that, in, the, in the space of the envelope, something else happens, a turn happens. Equally, I think, in the, in the silence, we don't know what Mountbatten said. I, we are all speculating. But we know what Gandhi left. He leaves an archival document. So silence, in fact, for that occasion, outlasts speech. Once again, uh, a hierarchical, tangled hierarchy of speech and writing in some ways. But of course, the, 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 what we first talk about is not the written, but the silent. And you know, I think silence in that political moment has its own strategy, its own density. So look, you've used the word turning, you know, the pivoting of things, um, um, uh, turning back on themselves, turning around on themselves, um, the, the metaphors you often use and you've used in this conversation are metaphors that not only connect one thing to the other, but also reverse the causality or reverse the relationship. So I think um, uh, I'd like us to end this conversation and open up to questions. I assume that that's the right thing to do. Yeah. So I'd like to do that by going back to what I said, that you are a kind of pacifist who is not passive. And I want you to show the, um, uh, the, the, the Korean work, if you can. Um, because I think there is something in that uh, where you are both the antelope and the tiger, or whatever it is, the panther. And I think that says much about the entangled nature of this, of the structure of this show. Listen, why don't you describe the work yeah. and then I'll pose my question. Yes, sir. You know, there's, at some level, there's a tenor in the exhibition. There's a, also a tonality. There's a probably blacks and whites. There's a blueness to the Mikola Ridney sea coast that breaks as aircrafts come, but there's a bleeding red in a Mona Hatoum hotspot that bleeds into the exhibition site. But I think the, the two works that Homi alluded to, one is of these three soccer players who constantly seem to be in a state of fall, but at a diagonal to this is another work that sits outside the sort of linear readings one may make between certain objects, but in fact talk from the side, is uh, the Korean artist Kim Byom, who has this image that seems like it's playing off National Geographic TV. Um, it's a chase in an open landscape where, as you observe, you realize something's gone wrong with the chase. As if on a Mobius strip, uh, the prey has run so fast that now it's behind the predator. Unbeknownst to the predator, that's something happening from the back. Um, or in the case of the three television sets there, uh, which align with Cartier Bresson's games in a refugee camp where, in fact, it looks like people playing have raised hands as if they're about to fly. Some are laughing, but they were small, isolated puddles of joy in a refugee camp to alleviate anxiety that plays alongside this soccer players who constantly seem to be running, but suddenly they take off and they fall on their own. And often they fall on a, fall on a line because that's the borderline. That's where territory ends. That's where another nation begins on a field. And that's the place of a foul. But the foul is erased and only the fall is seen. Um, and so the hand, raised hand of the, uh, of the refugee uh, and the hand of the ratification of partition in AICC, which happened a few weeks afterwards, speak to each other. But the chase and the fall form another alignment between uh, the footballers and the open landscape, the in the wilderness. <laughs> you've, made, you've made my job very complicated now, so I'm going to simplify it a bit. I was very interested in the that that work by the Korean artist yes. because it it resonated with me, and it resonated with this idea that here you have. Um, Gandhi, who has a great moral stature, I think what's so interesting, Gandhi, who is the pacifist, although a very canny strategic pacifist, 
knowing when to speak, knowing when to write, knowing when to be absent, knowing when to be present, is trying for this strategy. He is trying, is this a tiger or a leopard or what is this? Yeah. So here you have the, uh, what's that animal? The gazelle, antelope or gazelle. Tiger goes after the antelope or gazelle. After some point, there is a peripeteia, like in Greek tragedy, a moment where things shift. And the morality, in a way, of the pursued animal becomes the perspective from which to see the tiger, who in this case, eventually, is chasing his own tail. So there's a reversal of power relations. There's, there's a, re a reversal of uh, the notion of speed. There's a reversal of the notion of who is the victim and who is the predator and why the victim might not have the power to overcome eventually the predator but has left a great moral lesson to be learned. And these moments of reversal are to me more than tangled hierarchies or tangled non-hierarchies. The movement of that show, the, the movement of the show in the gallery, and the idea of moving uh, through these ideas, it seems to me, is much more to do with this, there is a loss, you have been chased, and then with what remains, you make something that is more relevant, as indeed with Gandhi, than the, uh, than, than, than the ty tyranny, the powerful tyranny of the fascistic or the authoritarian. And I think here, uh, the Zarina come, fits in very well because, yes, she made those works of the border, you have the maps, but then she turned that experience of border, of being expelled. She has these very moving writings about what it meant to when she and her parents had to leave the campus of the University of Aligarh in a, in a little van with the fields of burning and people dying. She's written beautifully about that. So she is pushed out. She is pus pushed out. She is displaced permanently. She draws the boundary, but slowly that line starts becoming, you know, those great works she makes where she draws her various residences. She draws the home, the outline of the various homes she's had. She dates them, Los Angeles, Tokyo, etc. So that bordered line where she was expelled, she was the victim, turns through her art into a line of rebuilding, accommodation, and some semblance of finding a home. I mean, you know, at, interesting when you were speaking about the spectacle, I was also thinking that there's also the absurdity of the fearful carnivore <laughs> who should ideally just turn back and know that the antelope is a herbivore, is a vegetarian, as Gandhi was, and it's not going to consume. So in a way, there's also this absurdity is actually <laughs> even heightened. I never thought of that one at the back as a vegetarian, but it did cross my mind as you were speaking. Um, as this kind of peculiar, Relationship, but once again, another form of entanglement, you know. Yes, dear, but, <laughs> but this, I can't go with you. I can't imagine that the line, the thing saying, I'm a vegetarian and I'm a non vegetarian. I think that this is to demand too much, but I think that's a fine note to end on. Thank you very much, and thank you all very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there any question that uh, to Homi or to me, or we should call it a wrap? When I, um, I saw the work in John Hansard Gallery, Covering Letter, um, I think it was o o September maybe, and I've seen the work previously as well, but when I saw it again in Cochin, it did occur to me that we're living in that moment again with war in Europe, of course, between uh, Russia and Ukraine, and it made me think about who today would have the moral strength as a pacifist who's not aligned to a nation state 
um, who is not somehow implicated within the kind of military industrial complex that the world sort of I I works under, and who today could write such a letter to Putin? And if they were to, you know, what would it say? The, the very open-ended question is, that doesn't deserve an answer, but it's something that I wanted to share. <laughs> well, you know, I've been a little slightly skeptical about the nature of the letter, as I've been saying. You know, I don't, uh, as I said, I think he's writing more a letter to himself, affirming his ideas. I don't think there was a uh, crap in hell's thing that Mr. Hitler would have said, well, let me meditate on this letter for a few minutes. He must have said, well, naturally, this guy isn't an Aryan. I mean, who is he? How, well, what does he mean even writing to me like that? So, I, I mean, this is, of course, all, con all conjecture. Um, but you know, the, 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 this would need, on another occasion, um, a longer discussion about the efficacy of pacifism and what we would mean, uh, what pacifism would mean today, um, or, ev or ever, because um, I did a whole th three-year seminar um, on violence and nonviolence. And something that we have to accept is the ethics of nonviolence depends both for its moral uh, commitment but also for its political efficacy on the presumed and anticipated violence on the other side. You see what I mean? So it's not exactly a Mobius strip, but it's something like that. I am not, please don't get me wrong, Gandhi, Mandela, various people, I am not suggesting in any way that they were not, um, um, uh, Im they didn't embody very noble ideas, but I'm just saying as a structure, as a political structure, as a, even a moral structure, your pacifism depends on there being a perception that there is going to be a genocide, or there is going to be a violent, um, a beast-like attack from the other side. And then the, how you negotiate that is the great genius of Gandhi and, and of Mandela. Pacifism is a provocation, in my view. It is not simply being a good, God-fearing person. It is a very clever provocation, beautifully handled by people like Gandhi. So my feeling is that we've had very few who could walk on that edge of being a provocateur and being a prophet at the same time. You see what I'm saying? It's not a question of uh, inspired innocence or goodness. It's a question of moral intelligence that I would say that's what both Gandhi and Mandela, just to think about another person, had. Mandela knew exactly when to turn the violence off, when then to create another language. Um, um, Gandhi did it through silence, and he did it through the fasting. Um, you know, these were, as you know, these were acts that were not even in the Congress party always. People said, this is a kind of moral blackmail. But the fact that these acts were acts of interpretable and ambiguous silence. You know, he didn't come out and say, I'm virtuous, I feel this, I believe in universal this, and I believe in universal that. He just stepped out of the discourse and created a fearsome vacuum, the underside of which, the, the outside of which was politics, and the underside of which was death. Could he die of the past? So I'm just s saying straight away that I think it's more complicated than a great uh, pacifist um, um, uh, hero. You know, this may not make me popular, but this is what I sincerely feel, both about the structure, the conceptual structure, the political structure of uh, violence, nonviolence, and how they depend on how they depend on each other. You know, it's very funny. Uh, I would not have even been able to assay a response to you. I don't know who 
could actually be that. But I received a really interesting invitation, which never in my life did I ever think I would receive. Just before coming here, I received an invitation from the Vatican saying that we're going to uh, do two days on questions of violence, nonviolence, decolonization, etc. And would you be one of the four speakers? So I used to always think uh, that, and there are many sides to this, that the Pope is a good leader of the United Nations, you know, General Secretary. He would be quite good. That doesn't mean he didn't, you know, there are lots of questions about what he did during the generals in, uh, not that he participated with the generals in, in Argentina, but was he too quiet, was he not? All of that is true. So maybe after I have this encounter with the Pope, I'd be able to give you some response. Because the, the letter of invitation is remarkable. It is remarkable in the way in which it deals with, uh, it, it deals with poverty, it deals with underdevelopment, it deals with war, and the use of war, like you know, the United States um, marching into, uh, into Iraq mm -hmm. on, the, on grounds that didn't exist, uh, weapons of mass destruction, they more or less knew even. So I, I just think I'm looking forward to this conversation because it's written from very much a position of ethical intelligence, um, which I think I really appreciate in somebody like Gandhi, and maybe in this pope, rather than, I take that view rather than know the, uh, than the view that he's a great Mahatma, which he may well be, but I don't know what the advanced soul looks like. Do you see what I'm saying? I have no experience of that whole way of thinking. He may well be that, but I admire him from my own rather secular perspective as, as, as a very, very remarkable maker of history. Um, Jitesh, this is to you. Um, your work uh, regarding um, the letters and um, you know, you've talked about Jawaharlal Nehru, you spoke about Gandhi, you spoke about a number of um, aspects of your practice. And uh, to me, when I'm listening to, when I listen to you and when I, you know, the, uh, examine your work, um, there is a sense of uh, transition that happens uh, as audience, me being the audience, from a point where uh, memory exists. Uh, we spoke about the entanglement of memory. And then you move into a space or a, there's a transcendence which happens into a new space uh, as audience where memory plays a part and there is a whole new dynamics that happens within that space. But there is also for me a point where things are very static in that dynamism. And uh, can you hear me? Yeah, so I was talking about the, the dynamism that happens within the transcendence that happens when you move into a new space uh, for the audience, me as the audience. And similarly, with regards to the letters that Baba spoke about, uh, which Gandhi wrote in silence, as I see it, there is a dynamism which is, which is taking place or took place in that at that particular point. I'm curious to know whether you as an artist at any point have you drawn from these points of, of uh, stillness, or these points of static um, uh, embodiment that take place while one experiences the dynamism? Am I clear? Yeah. I mean, at, at the level of the studio, at any given point that something transitions into a work, there's a sort of silent pivot at that moment. This is, it's going into a wormhole, so I don't even know if that makes much sense, but you know, I, I don't think I'll elaborate too much on it, but I think it's, it's at a certain moment of vacancy is actually when the possibility of the work appears as even possible. And I think that's a site of stillness. Then I think in terms of structural dynamism within a work of how a body would move, etc., those are, of course, other considerations. Like, for instance, in there it says public notice three, uh, the 70,000 light bulbs that become a speech delivered at a certain moment, but the manner in which you ascend on one side of the staircase at the Art Institute, uh, you reach mid-level and you have four ways to go. 
you have another, you have two ways to go and then four ways to go. But then you walk any one of those paths, right? Your body cannot go in two paths at the same time. But if it went one path, you have a distinct feeling you haven't read other paths. When, when you go back, you realize that they are mirroring of each other. It's doubled at the center, quadrupled at the top. So there's a kind of the structure of an echo that gets mobilized through your movement through the work because you've gone back to read it. Uh, equally, the letters, the numbers, and the words are all static. But essentially, because they are lights and they are in the five colors that the US Homeland Security had marked as threat codes in post 9-11-2001 world, you're reading Vivekanan's speech through a national security coding system. But every word that you read leaves an after image, producing a different dimension of illegibility and even stability. After about three steps, everyone moves to the edge of the staircase. You can't walk in the middle. So it really created health and safety confusion for the museum, who ran it for an entire year between 9-11-2010 to 9-11-2011. It was a complicated install to run because it is disorienting after four or five steps. So all of those are internal structures, as is the disorienting part of walking into covering letters. So I think there's a stillness at the level at which the work moves, but I think central to the condition of reading are these instabilities.